Hello, everybody. We are going to be getting ready for the Speak Up and Inspire series that is going to start here in a few minutes. So please get situated, get comfy on your couches or in the bed, bring the family along. We are going to be talking to Mr. Abdullah Shabazz, who is um, an artist and a musician, but he's also an advocate in his community. So I hope that you will join us for his interview at 8 o'clock. No, this... <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> oh, no. We are going to be going live here in about two minutes, about two minutes. We are going to be going live with our interview with Abdullah Shabazz, who is an artist and advocate in the community. So please join us in about two minutes as we talk to him live here on the Speak Up and Inspire series. Facebook Live with Abdullah Shabazz. Hi, Katrina. How are you, love? Hi, Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. We have about one more minute before we get started. Y'all have to forgive me. I didn't feel like doing my hair today. It's twisted up. And uh, yeah, I didn't take it down. My, my, my family's giggling at me because I didn't do anything with my hair today. <laughs> We have a few more seconds before we get started, so please get comfy wherever you are. Have a good internet connection, and we are going to go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, this is Tiffany of the Speak Up and Inspire series, and today we are going to be talking to Abdullah Shabazz. He is an artist, um, he is also an advocate in the community, and um, he has been doing some really great things. I learned about him in the Blacktopia group. If you remember, we had the Blacktopia founder, Jonathan Coleman, on our group, I'm sorry, on our interview on the Speak Up Inspire series a few weeks ago. Blacktopia is a group that is for Black-owned businesses and for Black professionals. That's where I met Mr. Abdullah Shabazz. I noticed that he was doing a lot with his music, but also he is a strong believer in community. And that's what the Speak Up and Inspire series is all about. Before we get started, I want to go ahead and say from the very beginning that I did not go to work today. Um, I had a high pain day and have not been feeling well. So please excuse me if I am not on point today, um, but I'm sure that you will keep me on my feet as I invite you all, as usual, to um, comment, ask any questions, um, say hello, tag anybody that I might mention, especially if they are friends of yours, and also um, add Mr. Abdullah Shabazz as a friend. He also has a Facebook page as well, um, Abdullah. A-B-D-U-L-L-A-H. So that way you can tag him if you have any questions um, during our interview. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And the Speak Up and Inspire series, as you all know, um, is a platform for or started off as a platform for domestic violence survivors and sexual assault survivors. Since then, it has turned into much more. It is now a platform for anyone in the community 
who is doing really good things in the community. And so that is the main mission and the purpose of the Speak Up and Inspire series is to talk to people, ordinary people like you and me, who are doing good things in the community, who are dedicated and passionate about helping people and helping others, um, especially when it has to do with mental health, domestic violence, sexual assault, um, youth, children especially. Um, those are the, the main community resources that we like to interview on the Speak Up and Inspire series. But if you're passionate about anything, whether it's animals, whether it's schools, whether it's um, politics, and it's something that is geared towards helping someone, even if it's one person, we want to have you on the Speak Up and Inspire series. We want to talk to you about who you are, what your businesses are, what your brand is, and also what you are doing in the community to help others. So we're going to be interviewing Abdullah Shabazz tonight. He should be joining us here really, really soon. I see that he has checked in. Um, we are going to be talking to him about his music. We're going to be talking to him about his personal brand. We're also going to be talking to him about what he does in the community that is inspirational to others. Um, he has a very strong focus in the community, um, and I thought that it would be great to bring him on. For the first couple of months that we did the Speak Up Inspire series, we were talking to all women, but we have recently been talking to some very strong-minded, family-oriented, community-involved men. And Mr. Abdullah is just another addition to some of the exceptional men that we are um, interviewing on the Speak Up and Inspire series. So I see that he is with us. So we will go ahead and bring him on right now. Remember, if you have any questions, if you have any questions or if you have any comments to say to Mr. Abdullah, any comments, I will definitely see them. Any questions, I will definitely see them. Please make sure that you stay and stay tuned because I have questions as well. Um, by the end of the speaker today about an event that Butterfly Visions Project is hosting this weekend, um, as well as the following weekend that we want to personally invite you to. So make sure that you continue to watch, you post your questions, your comments, and stay tuned for um, two special events that are coming up that we are involved with um, that will get you also involved in your community. Hello, Abdullah. Uh oh, he said, hold on. Okay, so we'll keep talking. <laughs> um, so while we are waiting for him to get ready, um, I always put a question out there when we start our interviews, and especially when we're um, waiting for our guests to come on. So our question for this evening is, if you had a large amount of money, let's say 50,000 plus, if you had $50,000 plus and you could start your own organization that helps the community. What kind of organization would you start and why? So post your answer in the comments. If you had a large sum of money, and this is a new organization, not an existing um, organization. So you have to be a little bit creative for those that I know that are on and watching right now who already have organizations. If you were given a $50,000 check today and you had to invest it in a community effort to help people, any population, what would that be? What would that organi organization be and why? Who is your, gonna, who, who would your target population be? I would love to see your answers and I will read off a couple of them before we get off of our interview this evening. Hello, Mr. Abdullah, how are you? Peace and love, Tiffany, how are you doing? Sir? I am doing good. Wasn't feeling too hot today. So I've been home today, relaxing and waiting for your interview. <laughs> yes, I'm currently texting someone on Instagram. They're asking me what I'm doing right now. I'm telling them to come over on Facebook. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, I see a couple of uh, people that I do not know, so I'm assuming that is your network and your friends and family that are joining in. So that's a great thing. We always like to have um, new viewers, especially when they are supporting our guests. Can you tell me where are you? Where are you residing right now, so we can know where you're at? Chicago. Chicago. My um. 
my uh, cousin, my cousin, I have a, co a cousin in Chicago. Um, I've never had a chance to get there. So I don't know. I don't know. What's in, what's in Chicago? What's to visit in Chicago? Okay. Let me give your viewers an insight of Chicago. Okay. Foremost, it's the third largest city in America. Okay. It's the third largest city in America. It is the largest city in the United States that was founded by a black man. Oh, wow. This, I did not know that. Okay, tell me more. <laughs> There's a museum on the south side of Chicago called the Usaba Museum, and it's named after, uh, realistically, the founder of Chicago, uh, John Paul D Baptiste Usaba, who okay. was, um, I think he was Haitian, mixed okay. with French, some, some of that sort, but he founded Chicago as a um, trading port back in the late 1700s. Oh, wow. I did not know that. I did not know that at all. I just learned something new. <laughs> but then I always learn something new when I'm talking to people. So yeah, that's it. That's very interesting. I never knew that. So what if I was to come to Chicago, what would be some places that um, I should visit while I'm there? Okay. It depends on what you like to do. Like most sisters like to shop. Downtown is always a great place to shop at downtown. Okay. You know, well, well, the summer just ended, so you just missed out on pretty much everything we did throughout the summer. We got all the mm -hmm. events in the summertime, but um, let's see, football season is in full effect, so everybody like to go see the Bears. Um, got it. Are you a Bears like, fan? Huh? Are you a Bears fan? I, I'm, a, I'm a Chicago fan. I'm a root for the Bears, win or lose. Okay. All I, right. I, I, you I know. <laughs> It is what it is, but um, right. High Park, that's on the southeast side of Chicago. That's actually where President Barack Obama's from. Okay, okay. So that's one of the richest black areas in Chicago. That's always a great place to go. Bronzeville is a historically black area in Chicago. That's always a good place to go. Okay. Um, Woodland, these are all south side. Um, near west side, that's always a great place to go. Of course, Lakeshore Drive. Always, it's it's always something on on Lakeshore Drive. That's like one of the busiest uh, streets in Chicago. Okay. Pretty much the pretty much the whole city itself for certain places they talk about in the media. That's Inglewood. You know, Inglewood is one of the finest places in the city. But right. I, I'm comfortable there. You know, I've been around there my whole life, so it doesn't bother me personally. Right. But um. Uh, right. Nice. Was, mostly South Side, because that's what most that's what the majority of black people in the city are at, South Side. All right, got it, got it. Okay, now I'm a big foodie. Whenever I travel, I have got to check out the local food. Like, what is the place? Give me, give me three restaurants that you would refer me to if I came to Chicago to eat. You can go, you can go to Garrett's for the popcorn. Okay. That's downtown. You can go to Harold's on the South Side. That's the chicken place. You can go okay. to Uncle Ring on the West Side. That's the chicken place. And you can pretty much go anywhere in Chicago for the pizza. Okay. <laughs> you said three, I just gave you four. So, oh, Got oh it. Um, what I, I forget the name of the donut shop. That's far south side. It's one of the oldest donut shops, and it's black owned. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. All the okay. Way the so, and, you know, and she's been there for about 60 some years. So, the donut shop in Chicago, that's definitely somewhere to go. Okay. You know, okay. Got we, we it. Eat good. Yeah. Okay. So I I'm a big New York fan and going to New York to eat. So mm -hmm. and I always hear this debate all the time with New York pizza and Chicago pizza. Man, New York pizza ain't got nothing on Chicago pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Have you even had New York pizza? <laughs> It's the joint on all this stuff. They ain't got nothing on Chicago pizza. I be <laughs> in New York. Shout out to all my peoples in New York. Nice. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to take your word for it for right now until I taste it for myself because New York has some good pizza. <laughs> nice. I love it. I love it. Okay. So let's just jump right in there. Tell me about you. When I came across you, it was because of your music. So let's start there. Tell us about you, your being a musician and where you started from. Okay. Um, 
first and foremost, I'm Abdullah, born and raised in Chicago, West Side to be exact. Uh, did nine years in the United States Army. Uh, did four combat tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Wow. Um, Thank you for your service. Yeah. Traveled, traveled 30 different countries around the world. Got lots of great experiences, great military friends, great brothers I still keep in contact with to this day. Wow. Okay. Uh, as uh, far as my music, I started rapping at 14. Um, when I got in the military, my music career began to grow as I became a better artist and a better lyricist. Uh, when I got out of the military in 2011, I started frequenting the poetry scene here in Chicago. And that's why I really got my my big start is just uh, frequenting the poetry scene here in Chicago. And on uh, 2015, I started putting out music on a regular basis. And then in 2018 is when I released my first global album, which I'm going to show right here. It's called okay. Black Determination. Nice. nice. You can see that picture is an image of me and my son. I think my son was about two on that picture. Uh -huh. And I'm teaching the djembe, teaching him how to play the djembe drum. Okay. And so um, I released that last year. Got a great response for from it, you know, got international spins and everything, so that was definitely a great look. And yeah. then, um, all, and then this year, um, what I began to do was I began to uh, put more of my music out on different social media websites like SoundCloud. So mm -hmm. I began to do what I call a monthly exclusive series, where once a month I put out a new song okay. and just build my fan base up so from there. And then, all then last month I put out my second album. Uh, black neighborhood. Yes, and I think that's the one that I've seen. Yes. <laughs> okay. Black neighborhood. Right. And I currently got two singles out on YouTube for the Black Manhood album, which is called um I'm gonna put those in the I'm gonna put those in a link. Yes, yes. Anything that we talk about, anybody that you tag, anything you want to share, please put it in the comments. That way everybody yeah. can can see it. <laughs> Brother Tyrone Perry, that's my dog. That's my day one. Ty, peace of love to you, brother. <laughs> you know, that, that's like my biggest fan right there. So, you know, um, that I currently got two music videos out on YouTube. I've been doing a lot of feature performances. Mm -hmm. Doing, you know, I, I'm, I'm also a soon to be college graduate from DeVry University. Um, I'm about think five credit hours away from graduating, which I should um, accomplish by December. Nice. Very nice. What are you majoring in? I'm majoring in uh, computer information systems with a concentration in forensics. Okay. That, that so, sounds like, uh, um, sounds a lot. <laughs> okay, so computer information systems with a focus in forensics. Correct. Okay, I'm gonna need you to put that in in Dumbo one one oh one terms. <laughs> what exactly like, does that entail? <laughs> you do a police like let's say is let's say I, I um I come up on a crime scene. Okay. And I'm the one that's responsible for uh, getting the evidence and doing an analysis on the evidence. So okay. I'm the one that collect the evidence, you know, make sure I put my gloves on, get whatever sample of the evidence, and I go back and I do research on the evidence I found to try to help out with any investigation. But in IT, it depends on the organization in which I work for. So right now, I've been in the post office for five years working mm -hmm. in MAPE, but I still want to stay there, and I just want to do IT work which will help um, postal inspectors and their investigation on certain temperament of the mail and things like that. So I, I, I truly believe my expertise in, the, in in forensics by learning and researching will help out a great deal. Plus, I did it somewhat when I was in the military. So right. I figured I'd go to school and get my degree on something I did when I was in the military anyway. Right. Yeah. So I knew the computer technology and I knew what forensics was, but putting them together, I wasn't quite sure how they went together. So now I got it. 
Got it. Okay. So with your, um, with your music, do you, are you doing like shows? Are you just based in Chicago when it comes to live shows or do you travel? Tell us more about your music. Well, that's the next goal of mine is to travel. That's my main goal for 2020. I want to get out and travel to different places across the country. So I'm in the process of um, working out something of that sort to uh, travel more. But right now I'm just um, pretty much doing shows all throughout Chicago, you know, open mics, what she says, hip hop events, whatever. Um, I've okay. done, let's see, I did the Black Entrepreneur Festival this year. I did a fashion show event last year. Mm. Um, actually, the lady that's in my current music video, her mm. mother is the person that organized the fashion show that I performed in last year. Okay. So I was able to work, I was able to negotiate a uh, um, situation to where her daughter agreed to be in the music video with me. And, and it was great business, you know what I'm saying? Uh, right. She's definitely professional in all the business dealings. Right. Good, 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 good. So I know that um, a lot of your music has a lot of, um, a lot of it is based on Black and Black men, um, you know, just unifying the the family, um, you know, being strong men in, in the Black community, strong fathers, so forth and so on. So tell us, what is your... I would say out of all of your music, what is, first question, what is the most popular? So what are your fans like? What is one of your most popular songs among your fans? And then two, what is the, the song that resonates with you the most, that identifies you the most in your songs, in one of your songs? I'm going to answer that first question because the second question is always the hardest for me to answer. I truly believe every song I do is, is impactful and powerful, but right. I I would say fatherly love is a, is a song that resonates especially with a lot of brothers. Okay, because it tell because in that song I'm actually giving kudos to all the hardworking fathers that's being active and involved in the lives of their children. And and for me personally, as a father myself, it's essential that fathers get more respect and more recognition for the impact they put in, in the lives of their children. I, I truly think and know that, especially black men, we're not getting enough recognition for what we truly do within, the, within our homes, our families, and with our children. And so my music, so that song, Fatherly Love, speaks on the importance of how, not only how valuable fathers are, but how needed they are, especially in today's society. Right, right. I definitely agree with that. Um, we have Butterfly Visions Project, which is my um, my nonprofit organization, or moving towards being a nonprofit organization. We started a mentoring program last year, but this year we made it. I don't want to say more official, but last year we were more focused on our domestic violence advocacy. This year we're focused on um, our mentor program. Um, and so, with our mentor program, I thought it was very, very important for us to not only have female mentors but also to have male mentors as well, because there has been studies done in the educational um, industry, um, but also in the communities that when men are involved in mentoring children or youths, that there is a greater response rate and there's a greater um, show of change because of the influence that the man has in the relationships with kids in the community, especially in the schools. So it's really important for, for men to be recognized. Um, I said when we came on earlier that we started off interviewing women and that wasn't intentional. I wasn't only looking for women, but that was because um, that was my main, my main network. That was the main um, group of people that I associated with because of what I do. Well, now um, I thought that, well, not now, but I started to say, you know, wait a minute, we've got all these women. We need more men on our show. Um, and so one of the men that we had on, you know, personally is Jonathan Coleman of Blacktopia. Um, which is where, 
Yeah, that's where I I met you at. That's where I recognized you at because he was promoting you and you were also promoting yourself in Blacktopia um, and on his media blast. So um, he's been one of our guests along with um, Cedric Sanders, uh, Delvon Harling, and as of last week, um, Rodney McGill, um, who all of them are doing something great in the community. So um, can you, is there some verses in that song that you can share with us so we can feel the impact of the song? Fatherly love. Yes. I'm speaking this from the depths of my tongue to always teach, motivate, and elevate my son to be your father. It's becoming a positive example to mentally influence your child to not be trampled and believing that you don't really value their work. As for me, I've supported my child since his birth, willing to put my family and my child first. I love my son till I take my last breath on this earth. There is nothing in this world that could separate that can separate my presence because the time that I spend with my son feels like heaven. I'm teaching them things that I learned as an adult. Beginning your child's life is such a positive result. Negligence with your child is such a negative insult because at the end of the day, it's never the kid's fault. We need to man up, y'all, and stop acting like scrubs and being involved in our kids' lives with fatherly love. Yes, I like it. Yes, make sure you put that link in the comments. Um, and everything that you that you just <laughs> spit out was was exactly right. We have to be involved in our kids' lives, especially the dads. Um, I know uh, as I. And um, it's really hard when I say single mom, when I say single mom, it's because I was not living in the house, the same household as my twins father. Um, so a lot of women, when we say that, it's not because we're, we're putting you down as the fathers, but it's just because we've had, we have them full time in our home under our roof and dad is not present, but their father has always been very involved and that's not something I can take away from him. So I'm really glad that that's something that you are, you're talking about and you're putting in your music because it's very, very important for us to recognize the men in our lives, recognize the fathers in our lives and not take that away from, from our men, especially our black men who are, who are doing what they're supposed to be doing with their kids so i appreciate you keeping that in the forefront definitely so we're going to get to that hard question what is the song that most resonates with you <laughs> song that's been resonated with me as of late is called meditation and prayer that's <laughs> off the new album um it's so many and i was just going over this question yesterday i was just thinking about it Right. Um, I'll say another song I, I wrote when I got out of the military called The Reality of Combat that stresses um, the importance of PTSD. Mm. Yeah. When soldiers go through combat, what do they face when they come home and how do they and how do they deal with PTSD? That's actually a true song because I'm diagnosed with PTSD mm. due to um, things I witness in combat. But at the same time, I've always held the notion that PTSD doesn't define me. Right. I define myself over the PTSD. It's just something I, I, I suffered as a result of going to multiple tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan. However, there are many, many soldiers that do come back home and they're mentally, psychologically, emotionally, physically broken. And although there are resources and help out there for them, the first thing that people need to recognize that if the that if the veteran or the soldier doesn't recognize that he or she has a problem, there's no way to solve the problem. That's true. That's and, true. And for me, and for me, what made me want to solve my problem was about five six years ago. Um, I had a I had a terrible fight with my brother, and my mom kicked me out, and I nearly committed suicide. And and when and when the suicide attempt failed, um. I was put in the uh, mental health ward in the VA for about six weeks. Mm. During that six weeks, I had enough time to reflect. And one, and one thing that kept bothered, one thing that kept coming up to mind was this, this 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 is not what I want my son to see me as. You know what I'm saying? Like that's re my son's the reason why I got out of the military because I didn't mm. want to go back and forth to war and not be involved in the life of my son. And so I had to I had to look myself in the mirror and tell myself. I have to be there for my son. My, I cannot allow my son to live in this world as a young black man without his father. You know, and 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 
And another thing is I cannot allow another man to raise my son. Even though, you know, my son's mother's boyfriend is a great dude, you know, I got nothing but respect for him because he does do good by my son. But at the end of the day, my son is mine. He right. came from me. Right. And I've been there since day one. And therefore, it's my primal responsibility to continue to remain active and involved with my son. It's crazy we talking about this, because I just talked to my son about an hour before I came <laughs> on. He OK. Called me, he called me like, what you doing? I'm like, I just <laughs> dinner, because I got an interview. He's like, he's supposed to eat dinner later. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but, I would like to I would like to expand on that a little bit. What's the name of the song that you're talking about? The one with combat? The reality is the combat. I've okay. never released I've never released that song, but uh, I have performed that song at various um events amongst mm -hmm. military veterans. Um every year locally in the local areas they have what they call is a VA creative arts competition. Well, veterans show off their not only their musical skills but their artistic skills mm -hmm. and, and 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 other forms of drawing and visual arts that they may that they may be good at and I was in a competition for like three four years one year I actually won I actually won to go to nationals but I refused to go why because <laughs> they, they wouldn't allow me to sing the realities of combat song and I'm like I'm not about to I'm not doing We Are the World Record. If I can't do the song without the combat, I ain't doing I understand. I understand. I definitely understand. Um, there is someone that um, I have been following, and she's invited me to um, several events that she does um, that's focused on veterans. Um, her name is Joy Cook. Um, the other person is Travis, who was on the Friday Live with me on Friday. So um, I want to connect you with them. I'm going to make sure that I connect you with them when we get off of the interview because they do a lot, um, probably something every month um, that's tailored to veterans. Um, with veterans with mental health, um, with providing housing. They're having something on September 27th um, to help with um, employment opportunities. Um, their main focus is veterans, um, which is something that I'm not really familiar with outside of, you know, what I hear. Um, I don't have anyone in my family living um, that is a veteran. So I really have not had that experience of um, being close to anyone who was a veteran, um, not to the point where I can ask personal questions that I probably would want to ask. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, as a veteran and um, suffering yourself from PTSD, are you getting help for that? Are you in counseling for PTSD? And how did you feel when you were diagnosed with that? I know I had it. I know I had it as early as I would say 2004. But here's the thing. When the war in Iraq started, it was taboo to say you had a mental problem. Um, I, don't, I don't know how other branches of service does it, but I know for me, being in the infantry, being boots on the ground, fight, actually doing the fighting, right. um, you, you could not come off as being mentally weak at that time. Right. Um, I would say I developed mine probably around 03, 04, but I first I first began to officially notice it around 08, which was my third tour in Iraq, where okay. uh, I actually got into a lot of trouble, and I was just having trouble just coping with authority and things of that nature. And um, I, I was coming home, I was angry, violent, want to beat up everybody. Right. And. At that time, no one really, no one really came out and said you had PTSD. Because if you did, they could have kicked you out of the military. Okay. So amongst, amongst um, all the soldiers, we just didn't talk about it. Now, right. when I get out of the military, I start going to the VA. Now I get, now I'm starting to surround myself around a lot of older veterans, a lot of Gulf War veterans, a lot of Vietnam veterans, and these older men started to coach and assist me on what to do. They said, listen, you got a problem. You've been to combat. You need to start going to meetings. You need to start going to counseling. Right. And so, but like I stated earlier, you can't really put yourself into that position until you 
the soldier recognized that you have a problem. Right. And so I had to tell it, I had to convince myself that, hey, look, I'm angry and violent and, and my son don't need that in his life. Because right. at the end of the day, my son emulates me. So if he sees me very hostile and violent, he's gonna pick up those same traits. That's right. So so what I did, so what I did was um beginning of 2014. I, I um, volunteered to sign myself up to go to the PTSD clinic, which where I stay now, which is about 45 minutes from Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, I went there for about three months, went the program, and one of the major things that I confronted when I was in the program was having to literally break down first in writing, then vocally, of the most co- traumatic experience I faced when I was in combat. Mm. At that time, I, I think the thing that hurt me the most was I was towards the end of my second deployment to Iraq. Um, on the patrol, and we get a call that some truck got hit by an IED explosion. Turns out this van got hit by an IED mother and father and a five-year-old kid in the van. The mother and father miraculous, miraculously survived, but the child was burnt in pieces, and we tried our best to rush him to the hospital. He died before we got to the hospital, mm-hmm. and that, that, that bothered me for years to the point I'll wake up sweating, you know, having nightmares because I can hear – because while we were driving that child to the hospital, I'm in the front truck. I'm on I'm on the what we call the turn. The turn is the gunner of the truck. And I'm screaming, yelling, get out the way, get out the way. And and and, and to know that you couldn't do really nothing to save a child, that 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 truly bothered me. Right. Truly bothered me. And I held that pain in for about nearly 10 years. Mm. Really, I really ever talked about it. Because right. the first time I came home, when I came home that year and I tried to speak to my family, my family didn't want to hear it. And that really, that hurt me as well because all my life, my family were the people I, I thought I could trust the most. But when, you're in, but when you're in the military and you experience something different that they don't understand, it's, it's very difficult for them to try to relate to you and coping with, with a very serious problem. So this is where the VA eventually came in, and not only did I go to the VA, but I surrounded myself around therapists who actually were veterans themselves, so they understood me a little bit better than your typical therapist with a degree. Not not, not saying nothing is wrong against that, because I at the VA, I do have a very great support system. Right. But to me, I, I relate a little bit better with an actual counselor or therapist who's actually a veteran. That's just my personal opinion. Right, right. That makes sense. That that definitely makes sense. Um, answer the other question you said, as far as like, what are my health support systems? Yes, I do go to counseling. I do go to mental health counseling. Um, the song that I told you about that I sing among veterans, that's mm-hmm. a that's a therapy. That it's called an artistic therapy group, which I've been in since I've been at the VA for the past six years, and um. Until recently, I was going to therapy for mil- military sexual trauma, which to this day still bothers me to talk about. Right. Understood. Understood. Um, I, I'm i really glad that you were able to, and what I guess what has stood out to what you said to me when you started explaining to us your, um, your diagnosis is the fact that you volunteered to take mm-hmm. place in this study. Um, And I think that a lot of people shy away from um, really facing what is going on with them, um, which of course can cause so many other problems, not just PTSD, but it can cause, you know, uh, drug abuse. It can cause um, suicidal ideation, suicide, um, suicide attempts, suicide 
actual suicides. Um, it can cause long-term depression. So many things can result from not speaking up and talking about what you're going through and any depression or anything that you might be facing. So I'm very impressed with you for stepping up and um, putting yourself in, the, in a vulnerable position, really, to talk about um, the traumas and the crisis and um, the things that happened to you when you were um, in combat and serving. Um, I can't imagine being in that vehicle with that child, um, trying to save their life and knowing that there's really nothing that you can do, I can't imagine that. And I can surely understand how that could cause you emotionally to have to deal with some things, even though I'm sure you know that it wasn't your fault, but just being in such a close pro proximity to someone dying and especially a child, um, I, I can't imagine that. that that's something that um, I never want to experience and hopefully I don't have to experience um, because that, that can be very traumatic and that can be um, something that some people might not ever get over, really. Um, I also suffer from PTSD from um, my sexual assault and just talking about it in the community, talking to people um, about what I went through, um, talking about the counseling that I did, and it was voluntary counseling like yourself. Um, it helped me to understand what I was going through. It, was, it helped me to understand my triggers, um, which are really, really important. I talked about those on my um, interview with Making Connections with Allie. Um, on Saturday about your triggers. And it's really important to know what your triggers are. Um, was that something that helped you um, with dealing with your PTSD, was knowing your triggers, or was that or was that not a problem for you? Yeah, I mean, um, part of my triggers was, one, I can't be around fireworks. It yeah. always makes me shake. Right. Another was, I, I noticed, I've been noticing over the past couple of years that my hands are dropping a lot of more things now than ever before. Mm -hmm. because I may have developed arthritis due to the fact I've had to hold my weapon a specific type of way for so for so long, for so many years right. that it is it is just cause I, I won't say discomfort, but to me just being only 35 years old and just dropping things all the time and stumbling sometimes when I walk, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not a great feeling. But I believe my greatest trigger is anger. And I, I, I can honestly say that over the past, going on two years now, I've been able to deal with my anger very well. Good. You know, Good. Not, not getting angry and upset at anything to everything and, not feeling down and depressed about myself. Because at the end of the day, um, I deserve to live a great life. Yes, you do. You and, do. And another, and another thing I like to do and what I'm currently involved in here in Chicago is um, in a community, myself and a bunch of other brothers, we've come together to start up this movement called Year of the King where brothers come together and we discuss a lot of depression, a lot of homicidal tendencies, a lot of suicidal tendencies, a lot of stress, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the sad thing about it is many black men out here are dealing with so many issues and that we, most of us truly feel that we can't come together and, and, and go to anyone for help to hear our story, to hear our pain. You know, they we always tell brother, we always tell men, especially black men, to man up in mm -hmm. the masculine. That's I think that's the most wonderful thing you could tell any person to do. If a person's feeling pain, they should be able to express that. If a person, like for example, I, I, I just dealt with death in my family recently and someone was trying to tell me not to cry at the funeral. At least out loud from the family, I said, "Listen, this person was important to me. I'm going to grieve, right? Because that's the outlet of releasing that pain and bitter emotion that I have in me. Right. If I can't grieve the loss of someone, who can I grieve to? And so, right. um, 
myself and countless others, we come together on certain weekends and we sit in a circle and we talk about the things that we've gone through in our lives, good or bad. Right. And we try to help each other to alleviate the pain that we that we've suffered. Because don't get me wrong, my 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 deeper sympathies goes out to any sister that suffers any type of abuse, whether it's domestic abuse, whether it's violent abuse, or anything of that sort. However, men go through abuse as well. Men go through emotional abuse. I was once in a relationship where a woman felt it was her God-given duty to put her hands on me. And I I nearly hurt her because I told her, listen, my mom taught me not to hit no woman, but my mom taught me not to get hit by no woman. So, yes. You know. And, I, I, and, and, and that's something that many men don't know how to cope with. Many There are many men out here that don't even know how to be men that don't know how to be responsible as men, that don't know how to take on God-given leadership capabilities they were instilled with as a man. Mm -hmm. And so that I'm involving myself with in the music that I produce and write, these are factors that can help brothers overcome the many um, obstacles that they've had to face, whether it's systematic, whether it's by design, or whether it's their own personal uh, undoing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, that is something that is definitely a need. Um, I know that the United Neighborhoods of Charlotte here, they had a forum um, about probably mid-summer where they got all the men together to talk about the violence in the community, but they were also talking about um, mental health as well. Um, I plan to host a, uh, a gathering of men in February that I would like to extend the invitation to you and send some information to you about. Um, maybe your, your group of men can come here to Charlotte to join us in that. Um, it's gonna be a men's forum, no women allowed except for me. <laughs> <laughs> but I will be there maybe one other sister but otherwise than that it's going to be all about you guys I want you to be able to have an open conversation to talk about the things that affect you as men um, but also for us sisters I'm going to get um, a list of questions from the ladies to sit there and ask you guys, like, why is this? Why do y'all feel this way? Why, you know, so forth and so on, so that we can get some feedback from you guys about the things that, um, you know, we have questions about. Um, I think that it's really important that men do get together, um, especially with your boys, um, bringing your boys together to meet the older men, to get some wisdom into them, to to let the boys ask the older men questions, um, to talk about relationships, um, to talk about the fact that men can be victims of domestic violence. They can be victims of sexual assault. They can be victims of so many things. Um, I know that at one point, my son, I think he was maybe a year old and he was crying. And my dad said to him, boy, you better man up. And I immediately got mad because I'm like, he's not a man. He's a child. <laughs> and I told my dad, I said, please do not ever say that to my son again, because he he's a child. But even now, I could see my I could see if my father was here, that would be kind of a struggle for him because he he was a manly man, and he didn't believe in boys crying and so forth and so on. But I had to explain to him then that you know even though my son is a boy, he still has the right to be uh, um, emotional. He has the right to be affectionate. He had he is he can grow into be a strong black man if he is able to express his feelings in a positive way. Um, so that's something that I think that you just brought out, that men need to talk about these issues, um, but also to be able to say that we can be victims too. It's not just the women. So that's a really good point that you brought up. Now, I'm, I'm glad you just brought that subject up because I just um, put a link in the comments of a song I did for my last album mm -hmm. called The Gender Wars, why I, why I actually went into detail about this issue pertaining right. to the, the, the discourse of relationships between black men and black women. And I right. and, and the only feedback, uh, negative feedback I get from that is, why do you focus so much on black men and black women? I'm like, well, for one, I'm a black man. For two, I only date <laughs> black women. Okay. For three, I'm, a, I'm an advocate 
and, and an activist within the black community. I'm going to always be on the front line for my people. But back to the gender wars issue, the problem with a lot, the, the, the issues with a lot of men and also women are going to be the, the, the relationships between each other. And right. my own gender wars addresses this. You know, it breaks down the dynamics of, okay, on the, on the women's side, this is how we men view this is how we men view you. And this is why more and more brothers are stepping away from sisters. Second right. verse, it goes into why sisters feel certain ways about brothers and why sisters are becoming more distrustful of brothers. The third verse ties all of it together. And it and it does and it places the blame on everybody. Right. Because I'm not an advocate of but you know, like I'm not an advocate of blaming sisters for everything. I, I truly believe it's disingenuous and it's unfair because let's say for example the single mother dynamic. Okay, how did she become a single mother? She couldn't do it by herself. She didn't have a baby by herself. She That's true. Pregnant. So <laughs> what was the man's role and responsibility in making her a single mother? Right. You know, I understand that if the relationship fails, that's one thing. Right. But even even if the relationship fails, there should still be a coexistence between you two. Now, this is why I get on the women. Just because you broke up with that man does not mean that you hold that man, you hold that child hostage against that man simply because the relationship between you and him didn't work. If he's a caring, responsible, and strong father with his child, it should not matter how how the past is. As long right. as he's doing about a child. And you two can coexist as parents. That 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 you know it should be a certain respect factor. And, I agree. And, 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 you know, and 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 this thing with this divide between men and women. Women think they can do it all by themselves without men. And <laughs> men think, man, we don't you know when we going to date other women or we just going our own way. Man, this is pure nonsense. <laughs> and it's destroying the very the very fabric that has always kept black people in this country together, which is family, even during slavery. If you weren't sold during slavery, the main dynamic that white supremacists could not um, break away from blacks were family. And Thank so we have, to, we have to strongly reemphasize the importance of what family is. Men and women have mm -hmm. to understand their roles because it's a role like, like I, I was telling a sister a while back, I'm like, listen, if you date, if you date me and we're in a relationship, I'm Michael Jordan, you Scotty Pippen. <laughs> now, I'm taking the game winning shot because it's on me to win the game. But right. you're gonna play just as much as an important role as I do. I'm the leader, I'm the head because I take on the most responsibility. But that right. that does not mean you are lesser than. Me. That means you on my side, you my rider. I like it. Very good. You know, mm -hmm. And this is not the, but I put more <clears> the focus <throat> on men than women. And here's why. As the man, you are the leader by default because you and, and I'm not trying to get religious or anything, but the the man has always had the position of authority and leadership in society, whether women want to admit to that or not. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, women feed off of the true guidance and leadership of men. Very they, true. You know, like, like for example, what's what's the main topic going on in, on social media? They talking about Fantasia, right? This mm -hmm. whole submission thing. I can care less about a woman submitting to me because I submit to God. Respect means to me more than submission because when you respect someone, you're going to submit to them because you because submission, according to the dictionary, means acceptance. Mm -hmm. A woman can respect a man because a man is doing what he's supposed to do as a man. Mm -hmm. He's doing his importance of true masculinity. Yes. This woman is going to respect him. Why? Because that's what women really want. They, right. they want that from a man. But at the same time, Ladies, you can't say you want that and ain't bringing that as well to the table. Because if you, because you want me to respect you, you gotta respect me. 
So it go so it goes both ways, you know what I'm saying? I agree with you. I agree with you. We have a question um, while we're talking about uh, relationships. Katrina said, is it hard for a woman or a man to have a successful relationship with a person with PTSD? What do you think? I think it's hard. It's, it's, it's definitely have a lot of difficulty to it. Um, it can work. I, 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 I've seen it a lot. Um, I know plenty of military soldiers that got PTSD and they still with their wives and stuff like that. And they both coexist to make things work because contrary to popular belief, if, I, if you're a man or woman, if your significant other has PTSD, eventually you contact the symptoms of PTSD because mm -hmm. you're living in a household dealing with the person that has PTSD right. or any type of psychological imbalance. You know what I'm saying? So, um, it is hard, you know, I agree with that. It is difficult, but it's not impossible. And you she say she's struggling and married, but here's my concept of that. Even though I'm not married, I have learned from the example of my grandfather, who to me is the greatest man I've ever known in my life. He set that example. He was married 40 plus years until he died. Good example. <laughs> and he, he struggled, he struggled with, um, I think he died from brain cancer, and he struggled. He was so frail that the last time I saw him, it was very difficult for me to look at. However, my grandmother stood by his side. She went through the struggle with him. She endured a lot of that pain, so she probably had some psychological trauma as well as a result of the pain and suffering my grandfather went through. Right. But it, it can work. It just depends on the dynamic that uh, Katrina's sister may have with her husband. If they if they got a strong bond, regardless of the the difficulties, they can still make it work. Well, I um to just for me to reply to what Katrina said, I think that even in any relationship, relationships can be can be hard. Um, it takes yeah. a lot to keep a relationship together. Um, I would say that even with someone with PTSD or any other mental illness that it takes for both to be in therapy, to be able to help each other when it comes to whether it's PTSD, um, major depressive disorder, um, even, even drug abuse, alcoholism, that if the other, if the part if one person, whether it be the male or the female has PTSD or any other mental health um, disorder that both being in counseling um, is what is recommended coming from a, a mental health profession. Um, myself, that it's always recommended that while the person that has the mental disorder, so that would be you, that if anyone that you're dating in a serious capacity or married to should also be getting counseling so that they can learn coping strategies. They can learn how to help you. They can learn how to communicate with you because sometimes a lot of times it causes even more trauma and more symptoms when your mate is saying things to you that are triggers. Um, they might not know it's triggers and you might not know that it's triggers, but if they're saying and doing things um, in those moments where things are really strained in your relationship, that can cause even more trauma for the person and thus more heartache and more issues in the marriage. So it's recommended that especially with PTSD, domestic violence, sexual assault, that the partner is also in counseling, whether it's together or separately, but it's definitely recommended that the, the partner go to counseling too, because there's things that they need to learn to be a, success, a successful partner as well. I, I, and, I, and I see that uh, Katrina said, her sister said she doesn't think she has to go. That's, mm -hmm. not, the, that's not the correct answer. No, it's not. I, I agree. That's that's not the correct answer. If your husband has PTSD, then you should be getting counseling and you should be getting information and edu psycho edu education as well to help your husband. I give, I, I give her a great example. Whenever every soldier that returned home from combat, if they were married, their wives by default had to go to counseling because they both because you think about it, you're away from that person for a year. Mm -hmm. Both people have changed. Yes. Let's say, for example, 
the man handled everything prior to him going to combat. He leaves. Now that now that responsibility is on you. Right. You may have trouble dealing with that because you're not accustomed or used to that. And let's say you get accustomed to it. Now the man comes home. He wants to resume his, his responsibilities he had prior to leaving. Mm -hmm. But now the dynamic has changed. And this is where the infighting and a lot of the trauma, emotional trauma, psychological trauma can, can occur. Right. So the military stresses the importance of both the husband and wife to go to counseling. And I don't know how it is now, but I know when I was in, it was mandatory for the soldier and wife to go to counseling. Yeah. To avoid to avoid certain things, to avoid um certain incidents of dealing with not only just PTSD, but just emotional abuse, domestic abuse, of, of that sort of period. Right. But the issue that we as black people we have to continue to address. We cannot ignore mental illness. Mental illness does not mean that you're weak or you're, dam you're a damaged person. Mental, weak mental illness just means that you're dealing with things that are in a traumatic or destructive manner that could possibly hurt you internally as well as in externally. You know, certain people drink and they don't think they have a problem, not knowing that they're slowly um, creating cancer inside their body that later on in life may catch up to them. Yeah. So, you know, so... Mental, mental, mental health awareness is something that we have to continue to um, expound upon and put out there to our people. There's nothing wrong with going to counseling. Had I not gone to counseling, I guarantee you I would not be, I wouldn't even be in this position to do this interview. Right, right, right. Um, I, I am a very strong proponent of mental health, not only because that's the field that I'm in, but also because it's, it's helped me. Um, being a survivor of several different traumatic experiences, um, and then being diagnosed with PTSD and major depressive disorder. Um, I've always thought, and my actually my parents as well, whenever I was dating someone that was, it was a serious commitment to someone, I always let them know, um, you know, really getting into, getting into the relationship once it starts to get serious, I've always disclosed, you know, I do have PTSD and I do have depressive disorder. And if that's not something that you're willing to educate yourself about, then it's probably not a good idea for us to date. Because I think it's very important that even though I'm a survivor and I feel that I'm a survivor, there are times, like I mentioned in my, my radio show on Saturday or my interview, was that there are times that I still get weak. There are still times Times that I have bad days. There are times where I have triggers and I need my mate, whoever my mate is, to understand that those things will affect how I act, how I react, um, what I do, what I say. And if you care about me in any way, shape or form or any capacity, even my best friends know what my diagnosis is and they understand and have educated themselves um, to know that that there are certain things that might happen with me, not as much now as they used to, but just being close to me and knowing who I am and having a personal relationship with me, I'm very open about that. And that's something that I feel that you, especially, and anybody else, if you have something that you deal with, depression, no matter how major or minor, you should still be able to openly disclose and people should be willing to be a part of your, your health and your journey. Um, so that's, that's really important. Really important. Definitely. Definitely. I definitely, I definitely agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I was going to add on to what you were just saying is, uh, once you admit to a person about your condition, definitely the person should decide whether or not they'll they want to deal with that. They'll be able to deal with that. And I think the person that's telling that person should be able to accept that person's decision. You know what I'm saying? That's true. But I, I've learned that if I'm dealing with someone in that capacity, I'm just going to tell that person straight up, listen, when you're going through something bad, I'm there with you. I'm there with you. When you're feeling down, I'm going to lift you up. When you start to go into that angry mode, hey, talk to me about it. I'm just I'm just gonna be a little hardcore with it because as a man in certain things I can't tolerate, but I'm gonna be respectful 
letting mm -hmm. you know, baby, I'm with you. I support you, but you don't have to go down this route. Right. We don't talk, we communicate. And that's one thing I truly know that's missing out of relationships. Not only just like um, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships and marriages, but just dialogue between men and women, period. Lack of communication. Right. Yep. You know, a uh, 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 lack of honesty. Mm hmm you know, like for example, a lot of a lot of guys they a lot of guys they think they can just mess around on their women and, and uh think that it's okay to just have all these multitude of women. Listen, if you want to live that life, go right ahead. But I know from personal experience when you tell a woman from the from the from the out start the type of person you are and the type of life you live, you'll probably get a better response than doing it behind someone's back. This is how a lot of women suffer emotionally because of us men not being up front and honest. You know, and, and a lot of women don't like to hear this, but I'm going to say it right here on the show, Tiffany. The reason why a lot of men don't tell women about their true intentions is because a lot of women out there really can't handle that truth. That's true. They That's really true. And, and, and to me, I think more women will benefit if they – we're able to accept the man's honesty. I'm not saying accept it in, in the manner of, oh, you know he got different women. I'm just going to go with it anyway. No, I'm just saying accept the fact that he was he was honest enough to tell you that openly so that you can make the best decision for you. Yes. And once you make the best decision for you, oh, my cousin. What up, cousin? <laughs> <laughs> what up, all the way from Ohio, baby, Columbus. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Hi, Brittany. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree with you. Um, that is something that is a big problem in relationships that um, men and women are not honest with each other. They're not telling what kind of person they are, what their desires are. Um, one could be one for, for fear, fear of what the other person might think of them. Um, but two, just because they've received so much backlash about being authentic and being their true self that they just don't disclose because they don't want to be judged. Um, there's there's a lot of different lifestyles out here that a lot of people don't understand. But one thing I've always said to, to people, whether it's in a friendship, whether it's business or whether it's in an intimate relationship, just just be your true self. Tell me who you are. Um, let's communicate um, and give me the chance to decide if that's the kind of person that I want to be with, whether it's an intimate relationship or whether I want to deal with you in a business relationship or as a friend. Um, just be honest. Just just be real about who you are. I try to be the same. Um, I wasn't um, I've always been a very uh, open person, sometimes too open at times with who I am, um, but I always expect respect in return. If you can't deal with my lifestyle, if you can't deal with who I am, you know, past and present, then that's okay. But at least give me the chance to continue being who I am. And if you don't like it, that's fine. But at least respect my honesty and respect who I am and where I come from. And I think that is, that's a really big problem, especially with um, male, female, you know, relationships, especially intimate relationships that we go into relationships not being our authentic self. Um, you meet the person's representative is what I like to say. You meet their representative. You don't meet them. And I hate that because the only representative I want in my life is my congressman representing me and the government on my behalf to get bills passed. So right. that's the only representative I want in life. And we have to get over this fear, fear, fear. Like you just said, people are in fear of, of being who they are. Who, I, you know, who gives a damn? What <laughs> other people are saying think about you? People gonna judge you every single day in life. That's period. That's how that's how that's how society is, and we cannot avoid that at any cost. And, and, and definitely for black people, we gotta overcome fear of everything because if we continue to live, you know, if our ancestors had fear, you think they would have really fought to get us out of slavery? If if our people had fear, knowing that what they went through in the South, and I just read something about North Carolina and. A lot of people don't know there's a lot of rich black history in North Carolina, a lot of ownership, you mm -hmm. know, in Wilmington and Durham and mm -hmm. other places in Carolina. And and if they and if they 
allow fear to overcome their progress, we we wouldn't even be in the position that we're in today that many of our people unfortunately take for granted. Like, for example, most people don't even know Chicago was founded by a black man. I didn't. <laughs> not until you told me. <laughs> I did not know that. Chicago is a rich, vibrant black city, which is why we have to stop gentrification from occurring in cities that we we dominated pretty much over the past hundred years. Right. So, you know, this fear amongst our people, we have to overcome that because last time I checked, I serve I serve a, a righteous God, and my God don't live in fear. My God don't. My God overcomes fear. My my God teaches me to be fearless. Right. So Love. um. So you know. That this is part of part of the dynamic that I stand for and what I represent. Good, good. Um, that was one of the reasons why, um, the main reason why I wanted to make sure that I got you on here as a guest because the, the name of the podcast is <coughs> Up and Inspire. And that is something that you are doing. You are doing that every day. I'm always seeing your posts now that we've become um, friends and connected um, through our networks. Um, you, you speak up a lot um, on things that mean a lot to you. You're very positive, as I can see. You're very well-spoken. You know how to get your point across without being disrespectful. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, we talked about a lot of things tonight. We talked about, you know, being a Black man and being able to, um, you know, be a real man, be a real father, um, take care of your responsibilities, being able to communic communicate with your queens. Um, but we also talked about PTSD and how um, PTSD is, is a real thing for um, your for you know people that serve in combat like yourself. Um, PTSD is a real thing for myself as a domestic violence survivor, as a sexual assault survivor. PTSD is real. And it's something that we need to be open to getting counseling for, to understanding, but also our partners or our family or our friends also understanding as well. And one thing about PTSD that we didn't discuss was our youth. Yes. Many of our youth suffer PTSD, uh, especially here in Chicago. You know, um, we always get a bad rep in the media for having a lot of murders and violence occurring here in Chicago. And what many people don't realize is that, unfortunately, a good portion of our youth here in Chicago are living in war zones. Mm -hmm. They yeah. are, they are indulging in things that you know, 40, 50 years ago, you wouldn't even imagine that will ever happen. So, um, a lot of our children are suffering because they don't get that that proper parental guidance at home. Right. You no, know, the the fathers. I could, I, I, I could tell you from personal experience. Uh, <laughs> put a great strain on me because I had men in my household. I mean, men around me, like my uncles and my older cousins, but without your actual father, that does take a toll on the psychology and, and shape of, of your identity. That's true. And many, many young boys go through this. Not only just boys, girls as well. You know, yeah. this is another thing I don't really see be brought up amongst adults, whether it's on the internet, social media, and actually out here because I'm, I'm out here in these streets every single weekend. I'm whether I'm going to bend or I'm performing or I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. Major thing we don't, one of the things we don't talk about is what what impact that the youth has in regards to PTSD. Mm -hmm. Whereas that he doesn't have that strong guidance from a, not only just his father, but he has a mother that's very hostile and demeaning, and it yeah. looks to put. You know, that breaks away at a, at a young boy's mental shape up so that so now when he becomes older he's responding and reacting in more feminine ways than he would had he had a caring and responsible father. Now look now let's reverse it to the girls. You got mm -hmm. the girls here, they're becoming more masculine than ever before. Why? Because they've had to take on that tough minded attitude, being in the home with mama, seeing mama do whatever she wanted to do, not really caring about her daughter. And then when the daughter gets older to about teenage years, 
Now, unfortunately, the mother's in competition with the daughter, which me has never made sense. Right. But the daughter, but these young girls go out here into the world, into these streets, they feel they have to be sexually promiscuous because they wasn't shown or they had an experience true love from a father. Totally and, agree. And, and again, I keep and reemphasizes the importance of father. Yeah, because every time I go pick up my son, I notice the difference. I notice that not only is my son positively affected in my presence, his cousins are as well. His cousins mm -hmm. like, oh, I want to go with you, and I want to do this, do that. Ain't no, and I love the kids, right. but <laughs> when you when you lack the the true essence of fatherhood, the mother also suffers. This is another thing that's never brought up. The mother also suffers because now she's, in a lot of ways, she's forced to have to take on double the responsibility. And it's hard. It's it's I, it's so hard raising kids in a home without a companion in the house because it, it's it's hard on us to have to, especially when you have a, a boy in the house. And I I don't say that to take away from the girls, but when a mom has a boy in the house and there's no father in the house, it's it's hard. We don't understand things that happen with boys mentally and physically. Those are only things that we can do research on and get advice about. But as a woman, we don't understand the things that our boys go through. So I can definitely understand how that could, yeah, it definitely can take an emotional toll on, on, on single moms who are raising, who are raising kids, especially boys when there's no father in the house. Well, girls too, Both, all, all three are going to be affected when there's not a man. Yeah. In the house. This affects a lot of single mothers, not all, but a lot of single mothers' future relationships with men because let because let's say a single mother runs into a man like me who who stands on morals principles who ain't gonna tolerate no nonsense. Mm -hmm. Any single mothers aren't equipped to deal with men like that. Why? Because they dealt with men that was the opposite of the type of man that I am. So true. And so that dynamic becomes nearly impossible to break because of the because some some women when they meet guys opposite of what they're accustomed to they kind of be that that kind of stand offish mm -hmm. and they still hold some type of distrust mm -hmm. yeah so I that woman <laughs> until i learned better until i learned to love myself and understand where it was coming from but yeah. Maybe I should be a, rela a late, um, relationship counselor instead of <laughs> I. <laughs> yeah, maybe you need to do a, another another major and get your uh, your your mental health uh, <laughs> credentials. <laughs> I'm going go for my masters for that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I don't I don't want to go to be a mental health counselor. I want to be a, I want to say Abdullah relationship expert <laughs> well i think you definitely i think you definitely will be able to to successfully do that uh mr abdul if you wanted to it sounds like you would have a lot to say and a lot of and a lot of positive things um we have actually gone past our time about 15 minutes um so what i want to do is i've already put a couple of things in the comments to connect you with um a couple of people um one is travis and the other one is joy cook they're the ones that have the veterans um, organization. Um, but I also want to uh, keep you updated about the men's conference that I'm putting together for February um, here in Charlotte. I hope that you will consider that. Um, and then I would also like to have you back on the show um, yeah. after the new year. I'm all booked up for the rest of the year, which is a blessing. Um, but I would like to have you on probably in early February around the conference time so that we can get some more feedback from you about, you know, being a strong man, being a strong father, you know, talk, keeping those lines of communications open between men. So if that's something that you would like to do, I would love to invite you back in February to talk to us. Yeah, definitely. Just send me the invite and I'll definitely accept it. 
Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, thank you again for being on the Speak Up and Inspire series. Um, you, I'll be doing watch parties all week to make sure that people don't miss um, this interview with you. I'll also send you the links for you to share it um, as well with your um, family, friends, and network, and we will definitely have you back on. I'll continue following. I'll continue sharing everything that you're doing, and thank you so much for being on the Speak Up and Inspire series. I greatly appreciate you having me on your platform, and for and once you share it to my page, my peoples, y'all y'all watch it, all right? Y'all y'all watch it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Thank everybody who um, who watched tonight. We had a couple of new people watch tonight. We had some of our faithful um, viewers watching tonight. I hope that you learned a lot. Um, there was a lot to learn. So have a great night, everyone, and see you on uh, on Friday for our Friday live. Have a good night. Thank <laughs> you.